a little longer term. And how do I represent all the humans in this room? Well, I might do something like, OK, I see one person. All right, I see another person, a third person. And so forth, but no one <laughs> counts people like this. So, literally, most of us, if we're even going to draw anything at all, are probably going to go one, two, three, four, maybe get a little fancy, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and so forth. And that's actually a system called unary. Uno, like uno implying one, where you just have one letter of the alphabet. You've just got this hash mark. And I, for efficiency, just drew these hash marks ultimately as straight lines, but I could have drawn them as little stick figures where to represent one person, one input, I just draw a stick figure or a hash mark. But this isn't all that expressive. If all I have is these hash marks, let alone stick figures, how might I represent something like the number 15 or 15 people in the room? I might have to do something like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. And that's just, it just does not scale very well. As the inputs get large, we need a better system than this. And it turns out that the system that computers use is not all that different from what you and I know. In fact, most people in this room, even if you are among those less comfortable, don't necessarily know how your Mac or PC really works, you've probably at least heard. That underneath the hood are zeros and ones, the so called binary system. So indeed, computers have more than just hash marks in their vocabulary, but not as much of a vocabulary as we humans. Indeed, we humans don't use binary, bi meaning two, zero and one, but decimal, dec meaning ten, zero through nine. So we have a lot more expressive capabilities in our normal human world, but I'd argue that these systems, Binary and decimal and everything in between and beyond are actually all quite familiar. For instance, consider this example here 123. So, this really is, of course, a number we know as 123. But all I just drew was just this pattern of symbols, glyphs, so to speak, sort of shapes on the board in chalk. But why do we immediately intuitively grasp this as 123? Well, if you're like me in grade school, you probably learned that this is,、uh, what, this is the ones column, this is the tens column. This is the hundreds columns. And why is that useful? Well, the simple arithmetic you now do to get from a pattern of symbols to a, a number we understand intuitively is what? 100 times 1, and then 10 times 2, and then 1 times 3, which of course is just 100, and this is 20, and this is 3. And so if we add those together, ah, so therein lies the sort of reasoning behind why this set of symbols means something real and numeric. Well, computers do the exact same thing. But they only can count as high as one. Whereas I was able to count as high as three. And in fact, if I kept going, I could go as high as nine in this system. Computers only have zeros and ones in their alphabet. So, what does that mean? Well, it just means that if a computer wants to represent, say, the number zero, maybe using three characters, three、uh, letters of the alphabet, so to speak, that's how a computer represents zero. So, not all that scary so far. It's exactly what we humans would do. And in fact, most of us would just ignore the leading zeros anyway. A computer, if it wants to store the number one, turns out is going to do this. And a computer to store the number two is not going to do the unary system, which I alluded to earlier. It's actually going to do this. And this is probably where the pattern starts to become less obvious for most folks. That's two. This is three. Curiously, this is now four. And now it really does seem to be perhaps cryptic, but it's not if we consider what binary really means. It means you have two letters of your alphabet, so two, two possible characters for each placeholder. So that really means we're going to need a ones place, a twos place, a fours place, and then eighth and 16, 32, and, and、uh, 64. And what's the difference there? Like these are. 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64. 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32
Yeah, one zero zero zero, and yet. You know, maybe I kind of technically need to add another placeholder to the board. If I want to fit that, I indeed need to do something like this. So I actually need to use now the eights column, and that's fine. But the curious thing in computing is that that's going to cost us something. You need more RAM in your computer now. You need more memory because you need something physical to store that additional bit, so to speak, binary digit. And indeed, all that's happened here, like the decimal system, if we keep adding numbers up and up and up, we go to 5, to 6, to 7, to 8, it's like carrying the 1, literally. And then everything else goes back down to 0. But how do we actually represent these things physically in a computer? Well, at the end of the day, the only physical input going into my computer here is this like, power cord, so electricity or electrons from the wall. And so how do I get from something physical like that to actually representing an idea like this instead? Well, what could we do? We could consider that, all right, maybe if electricity is flowing, I could store it and hold on to it. And if I'm holding on to some electricity, that's just going to arbitrarily represent a 1. And if I pull the plug and there's nothing there, you know, that's just going to arbitrarily represent a 0. So if something's there, 1. If nothing's there, 0. Or you can make this a little more visual. Here is a 0. There's nothing interesting going on about the back of my phone. But if I allow a little bit of electricity to flow, even though it's a little bright in here, my flashlight went on. So I'm storing a charge, and ergo, this phone now represents a 1. So 0, 1. So with one iPhone, how high can I count using this kind of approach? I mean, to 1, it's not all that compelling. So what more could we do? Well, let's see. Uh, does anyone have, uh, is anyone on their phone right now that I could borrow? Anyone who has a phone with a flashlight built in? May I borrow? I don't need it unlocked. All right, thank you. Let me borrow this. All right, so. If I now scroll up and here, what am I representing now? Yeah, so it's a 3, because this is in the 1's column. This is in the 2's column, so 1 plus 2 is 3. And then if we try to get really creative, let's do, oh, thank you. Very preemptive. All right. I now have three iPhones, all right. All right, and now this, I won't do any further than this. Uh, what am I representing now? Just seven. But I needed physically more memory in this case. But that's all it is. You can think of what's going on, thank you, inside of your, inside of your phone as just being a switch that's being turned on and off. And if you've ever heard the word transistor, or if you've ever heard the marketing speak Intel inside, that's speaking to the kind of hardware that's inside of your computer. Intel makes CPUs, central processing units, which are like the brains inside of your computer. And these CPUs and things they're connected to have lots and lots of tiny switches, millions, billions of switches that can either be on or off. So computers, thankfully, like our Macs and PCs, can count way higher than 7 or 8 because they have way more than 3 or 4 bits, way more than the equivalent of the three flashlights that we just had. But now this starts to get pretty uninteresting quickly. If I now want to actually be able to do something more interesting, I want to be able to jump to something like this. So ASCII, it's not really a useful acronym, but American Standard Code for Information Interchange. It just means some years ago, we humans decided, you know what? We want to be able to do more with computers than just numbers. They, we don't want them to just be expensive calculators. We'd like to be able to do things like word processing, albeit very simply. Later, we had email and, uh, and other such media. And so the world decided some years ago, according to this system, ASCII, you know what? In certain types of programs, anytime you see the equivalent of the number 65, like the pattern of bits, and we could do the math here on the board, the pattern of bits that represent 65, don't think of it as 65 in decimal. Think of it as arbitrarily, but globally consistently as the capital letter A. And then the world decided, you know what, let's take another pattern of bits. And if we ever see the number 66, let's just assume that that is the capital letter B. Fast forward to H and I. If you see 72 or 73, that should be an H and an I, respectively. And so long as the whole world agrees upon this, so that when you receive an email or you get a file on a USB stick or something like that, when you see that pattern of bits, you know that it should be this letter or some other letter. But it's context specific. right? An email program might uh, interpret these things as characters, but a graphing calculator or calculator might represent or interpret these things, of course, as letters. So with that said, quick little review. This is maybe a three-character email that's been sent to me. Underneath the hood, it's all in zeros and ones, but we don't care. We're going to start to abstract above the zeros and ones to letters. And if I see a pattern of zeros and ones that really represents 72, hint, hint, 73, and then 33, what's the message? 
as if you think back just a moment ago, hi was the message I was trying to、uh, communicate here because h is 72, i is 73, and now 33. You wouldn't necessarily know this in advance, but it turns out if you actually see more of the chart and the system that humanity agreed upon years ago, it's just an exclamation point. And indeed, there is a pattern of symbols and numbers for every,、uh, for every character that you might have on your keyboard. But all right, let's abstract further. If we don't want to just have things like numbers and letters, We actually want to implement graphics. Well, if you've ever heard the acronym RGB, it's kind of dated now, but it's still kind of there. RGB is red, green, blue. And it's just a system of saying, you know what? Let's use three sets of bits a set of eight bits, another set of eight bits, and another set of eight bits. And let's use those bits to store how much red we want on our screen, how much green we want on our screen. And how much blue we want on our screen. And this just means that if you have a lot, a big number for red, that means give me a lot of red. If you have a big number for green, give me a lot of green. And if you have just a little bit of blue, or a small number like 33, give me a little bit of blue. And if you happen to combine those three magnitudes, so to speak, you get this, you barely can see it on the projector here, but this like murky shade of yellow or brown. But this is to say, using that pattern of 8 plus 8 plus 8, that pattern of 24 bits, Is how a computer would store that shade of yellow in one tiny dot or pixel on the screen. So we've gone from zeros and ones to decimal numbers to letters of the alphabet or more interestingly, colored dots. Well, what of course then comes next? Well, what is an image that you see on Facebook or get in an email or the like? Like, what is the definition technically of an image? Yeah? What is an image composed of if you look really close at your screen? Yeah, it's just a whole bunch of pixels. In fact, if you take your laptop maybe later on and look really closely at it, depending on、like、how expensive the laptop is and how qual high quality the screen is, you might very well see all of the little dots on the screen. And those dots are each pixels, which means there's 24 bits representing every pixel in that photograph that you see on Facebook or that you just took on your iPhone recently. And so that's how we get to things like graphics. Well, what's a video? A video is just a set of graphics flying by the screen again and again and again. And so videos, really, Are just patterns of bits representing grids, rows, and columns of dots flying by the screen, image after image after image, aka motion pictures. So that's it for inputs and outputs. All we have now is an assumption that, you know what, if we want a computer to represent information, we have a system for doing it. We can do it with zeros and ones at the end of the day, but we can abstract, so to speak, on top of that so as to represent more interesting things. And here on out in CS50 and in computer science more generally, we now stand on the shoulders of all the people who came before us who figured that out and now just assume that computers can represent inputs and outputs. But now let's actually do something with them. So, an algorithm is just a set of instructions, step by step, for solving some problem. And what might one such problem be? So, this is an old school technology,、um, a phone book. And inside of a phone book is a whole bunch of、uh, names and numbers, and those names are generally sorted alphabetically. So, if I wanted to find someone in this phone book, like Mike Smith, What's a typical human going to do? Well, you could simply open it up, look at the first page. I don't see Mike Smith. Turn to the second page. I don't see Mike Smith. And just keep going and going. Is this step by step approach correct? Yeah. It's kind of stupid, right? It's inefficient, right? Because it's going to take forever to get to Mike, but it is correct. Because if Mike is here, I will indeed find him. So, what's a slightly more reasonable person going to do? They might still open to the front and maybe fly through the phone book two pages at a time two, four, six, eight. I can't actually physically do it very well. But in theory, this should be twice as fast two pages at a time. Is this algorithm correct? Not necessarily. Good. Why that caveat? Yeah, so even if I get closer and closer, what if he's just accidentally, by bad luck, sandwiched between the two pages that I'm flying over? So we need, oops, or on that page. So, so we need a fix for this. We actually need to then say, wait a minute, maybe if we go too far, maybe if we hit the T section for T coming after Smith, then we should at least double back at least one page. So fixable, but there is a conditional issue there. So it's twice as fast, but you might have to double back just a little bit. But no one in this room, even if you don't really use phone books anymore, is going to start at the beginning. What are you going to do looking for Mike Smith? You're going to go roughly to the S's, or if you don't really have the、like、cheat sheet on the paper, you're going to go at least roughly to the middle, certainly not to the front of the book. You're going to look down, and mathematically, you're probably going to see the M section, which is roughly in the middle. And then you're going to realize what is true. Where is Mike? 
Yeah, so he's over on this side. And so what can you do? Well, both figuratively and literally, can you tear the problem in half once <laughs> and then know that you can throw this half of the problem away? And now we're left with fundamentally the same problem, but it's half as big. And so now, what's the set of instructions? What's the algorithm for finding Mike Smith? It's the exact same thing. Now, this happens to be the M section and this the Z section, but the, fu uh, the fundamental formula is still the same. Go roughly to the middle, look down, ah,、oh, darn it, now I'm in the T section. I've gone too far. But here, too, can you apply that same logic, throw half of the problem away? And now we're left with a problem that's a quarter of the size. And we can repeat, and we can repeat, and we can repeat until theoretically, <laughs> until theoretically, there's just one page left on which Mike either is or isn't. So, what's so powerful about this idea? I mean, after all, it's pretty intuitive. No one's going to start at the beginning of the phone book and flip a thousand pages to find Mike Smith. Most everyone in this room is going to do roughly that kind of algorithm, save for the tearing. And so, why did we do that? Well, consider the efficiency. Consider just how much better this algorithm was by breaking it down into its component parts. So, what did I first do? I, I picked up the phone book. And a computer scientist and a programmer, more generally, it turns out, is going to start counting everything at zero. Why? Well, it's a little strange that we humans count generally starting from one, because what's the smallest number we can clearly represent based even on our old grade school math? Well, it was zero. Whether it's in decimal or binary. And so you'll see in the world of computing and programming specifically, we start counting everything from zero. So I've picked up the phone book, step zero. I'm then going to open to the middle of the phone book. And that's indeed an expression of what I did. And then step two was look at the names. Step three is a little different conceptually. I'm asking myself a question. If Smith is among the names, I'm going to make a decision. If he's among the names, then I'm going to call Mike. And I'm going to make a decision based on that piece of information. However, if not, If Smith is earlier in the book, to the left, I'm going to open to the middle of the left half of the book. And then here's the cleverness I'm going to go back to step two. I'm going to sort of stand on my own shoulders and just repeat the past work I did, but the work I have left is less and less and less. But it's still going to work. But if Mike instead is later in the book to the right, I'm going to open to the middle of the right half of the book, then go back to step two. But there's actually a fourth scenario. Mike's either here or here or here or not there. And indeed, if we don't anticipate this fourth and final scenario, our program might be buggy or flawed in some way, else quit in the case that we haven't found Mike at all. And indeed, if you've ever noticed your computer hanging or all of a sudden Word or some other program just quits unexpectedly, and sometimes the error message is literally that this program quit unexpectedly, it can be for any number of reasons, but sometimes it's something as simple as this. The human programmer who wrote that software didn't realize that, oh, there's a fourth thing that can actually happen. And if you don't write code to capture that fourth scenario, it is indeed unexpected sometimes what the computer might actually do. Now, let's call out a few of these things. So, in yellow here, I have highlighted terms that henceforth we're just going to call functions. Functions in the world of programming are just like actions, statements of actions. So, pick up, open to, look at, call, open, open, quit. That's a function, a procedure, an action. Any number of synonyms would work as well. Now, what are these things now in yellow? If, else, if, else, if, else, these are what we're going to call conditions in programming or branches, decision points, if you will. But how do you know which fork in the road to take, so to speak? We need to highlight the terms to the right there, which are these yes no questions, these true false questions. Smith among names? Uh, Smith earlier in book, Smith later in book. These are questions to which there is a yes or no, or equivalently, true or false, or equivalently, one or zero answer. And meanwhile, there's just one last piece. This here has what kind of effect, whether or not you've programmed before? How would you describe what steps seven and ten are doing? A uh, a what did you say? A recursive step, yeah, essentially.、Um, it's technically iterative here, if you're, if you're familiar, but we'll come back to that. But it's doing something clearly, again, it's inducing a, a cycle, a loop, right? You're literally going back to some earlier step. And so, indeed, this is going to implement some kind of cycle. But you're not going to get stuck in this endlessly, right? Because if you're constantly checking, is Mike here or to the left or not here, eventually he's not going to be there. And you can just quit altogether as per that last line. So that's it for vocabulary. And this was what we would generally call pseudocode. It's not an actual language, it's just like very terse English, but it communicates the point. There's no formal structure here. You just use as few words, but as clear words as you can 
to communicate your idea. Now, how good is that algorithm and how much better is it? Well, we don't have to get into the specifics of numbers or, or anything like that, but we can look at the shape of this solution. So if we just draw some xy plot here on the、uh, horizontal axis here, let's just call this size of the problem. And a computer scientist would typically use n as the variable here. So n pages or n people in the room or whatever it is you're trying to count. And then on the vertical axis on the left, that'll be the time to solve. So how many seconds does it take me to find Mike Smith or how many steps does it take? How many page turns does it take? So that's how much it costs me in time to solve a problem. And we might draw the first algorithm's slope, if you will, is just this straight line in red. And I'll call it n. Why n? Why is it just this one to one relationship? Well, if Verizon or whatever phone company adds one more page to the phone book next year, that might push Mike one more step closer to the end, depending on where that page is. And so the effect might just be to add one more second or one more page turn, a one to one ratio. By contrast, the second algorithm, how much faster was that intuitively? Where I went two pages at a time. Yeah. Yeah, so it's going to be twice as fast, and we would draw that here depending on the scale. It still is a straight line, but lower than the red line because for some number of pages, if it takes you this many steps with the first algorithm, it's going to take you half as many steps with the second. And so the yellow line describing the second algorithm is just going to be below it. But what's really powerful is to think about the third and final and amazingly most intuitive algorithm that has this shape. Technically, we'd call this a logarithmic curve, log base 2 of n in this case. But that doesn't really matter. What matters really is the fundamentally different shape that it has. And you can consider just how much shorter this line really is in the long run. It never, it's constantly increasing, it doesn't flatten out perfectly, but it grows ever so much more slowly as the, bigger, as the problem gets bigger and bigger. And you can think of it this way if Verizon doesn't just add one page next year, but doubles the number of pages in the phone book, The first algorithm might take twice as many steps. If it's 1,000 pages this year, 2,000 pages next year, Mike might be that much farther away, so it's 1,000 extra steps to find him. The second algorithm might be only 500 more steps to find him because, again, I'm flying through it two at a time. But what about the third algorithm? If Verizon doubles the size of the phone book next year from 1,000 to 2,000 pages, how many more steps is my third algorithm going to take? Yeah, it's just one. And that's like the powerful idea. You can take a thousand page byte out of that problem at once. And now, if you consider a silly scenario, but it kind of speaks to the power of this kind of intuition, if a phone book had like four billion pages, it feels like a really big problem. And indeed, it might take me four billion page turns to find Mike Smith in that case with the first algorithm. But how many steps would it take in the third algorithm to find Mike among four billion pieces of paper? So, 4 billion, you tear in half, you get 2 billion, then 1 billion, then 500 million, 250 million, 125 million. But it it's feels like this is going to take a while. I might need probably 32 fingers to count up that high, but it is indeed as few as 32 page tears. You can go from 4 billion to one page, dividing the original number of pages in half. 32 times until you're left with just that single page. Now, there's, of course, I'm cheating here.、Right? It's not that we are just being.、Um, Sort of stupid entirely with the first two algorithms. I am cheating in some sense, or really, I'm leveraging an assumption. What was true about the phone book in its original form that allowed me to even use that third algorithm? Yeah. It was alphabetized, right? If it were just in random order,、oh, this is a waste of time, this whole conversation. I have to look at every page if it's in random order to find Mike Smith before I can conclude he's there or not. And so the corner we've cut is that I have assumed that someone else, in this case, did the work for me. And so that ultimately invites the question well, wait a minute, how do you sort? A thousand pages of names and numbers. That's actually a different problem, something we'll come back to in the future. But when you think about websites like Facebook and Google、uh, for Gmail and things like、uh, Google's own search indexes, when you have millions or billions of pieces of data being stored these days, searching and not to mention sorting those problems is ultimately a challenge unto itself. And indeed, this then is just one of those challenges that we'll be looking at. So now let's take a moment and take a look at CS50 itself and give you a sense of what more we're, what's in store this semester. Indeed, If you haven't already, do take a look at this URL. And as Patrick alluded to,、um, this year we're making a significant investment all the more in the course's support structure in terms of the TAs and the CAs, office hours, section.